Hi, I'm Max Rudin, president and publisher of Library of America, and welcome to LOA Live. Library of America is a nonprofit organization dedicated to publishing authoritative new volumes of great American writers and to keeping the many voiced American literary tradition a vital part of our culture. A special welcome to Library of America fellows and members who support our mission. Tonight's program marks publication of this volume, Rachel Carson, The Sea Trilogy, volume 352 in the Library of America series, edited by Sandra Steingraber, who joins us tonight. Hooray. Uh, it is published with support from Edwin Matthews and the Gould Family Foundation, who have also endowed it through the Guardians of American Letters Fund to keep it permanently in print. Thanks to their generosity, it will stand as a lasting testimony to Carson and her contributions to science, to American writing, and to the cause of environmental protection and global conservation. A link uh, to the book uh, will be dropped into the chat. I should say that it will be available in bookstores in about two weeks. It is available right now from the Library of America web store, and there'll be a link to that in the chat momentarily. We're grateful to our partners for this evening's program the Association of Literary Scholars, Critics, and Writers, Bill McKibben and 350.org, Breast Cancer Action, Charlotte Sheedy Literary Agency, Jody Solomon Speakers Bureau, the Maritime Aquarium in Norwalk, Connecticut, Mongo Bay, Orion Magazine, the Rachel Carson Council, the Society of Environmental Journalists, and Terrain Magazine. Before her landmark book, Silent Spring, sparked the modern environmental movement, Rachel Carson was internationally celebrated as the author of an extraordinary trilogy of books about the sea. In these remarkably prescient works, she brings her unique marriage of scientific knowledge and poetic wonder to the world's shorelines and oceans, their beauty, fragility, and essential role in life on earth. The writing is lyrical and deeply personal, Growing up in Western Pennsylvania, she dreamed of the sea and her first encounters with it changed her life. Today, in a time of global environmental crisis, these books have new power, poignancy, and urgency. To talk with us about this, about her and this, uh, this evening, and about why we need to rediscover Carson's Sea Trilogy, we're incredibly fortunate to have biologist and writer Sandra Steingraber editor of this new Library of America edition. Sandra is senior scientist at the Science and Environmental Health Network and one of America's leading environmental writers and anti-pollution advocates. Her books include Living Downstream, an ecologist's personal investigation of cancer and, it, and the environment, and most recently, Raising Elijah, protecting our children in an age of environmental crisis. She joins us from her home in upstate New York. Uh, Sandra will talk for about 20 minutes and then take your questions and comments. The Q&A button is on your menu bar. Uh, don't be shy. Uh, and when you ask questions or leave a comment, please let us know where you're viewing from. And now it's my great pleasure to welcome Sandra Steingraber. Sandra, over to you. Thank you, Max. And, and thank you, Library of America, for hosting me tonight. And of course, for bringing uh, Rachel Carson into your pantheon um, where she belongs. Um, and for those of you new to Library of America as an institution, let me introduce you in a, a little deeper way, um, continuing on uh, what Max just told you. Um, LOA is a publishing house that's located outside of the profit dependent publishing industry. It's organized as a nonprofit. Um, and its self-appointed mission since 1979 has been to ensure that classic American literary books never go out of print, which for any author is just um, this remarkable thing. So it's, it, it, pre it literally preserves America's literary and cultural uh, heritage. And behind the scenes, um, which you, you can't see, but I got to, any mistakes or omissions in previous editions are corrected nothing is too small. Um, there's this kind of precision that is brought to all, to all these books so that scholars and everyone else can consider a Library of America title the definitive edition. Um, also, all the books so created by LOA are just beautiful objects um, from the binding to the elegant typeface and the 
the gold cloth ribbon. That's the little built-in bookmark. The paper is thin and acid-free, meeting archival standards of permanence, which means that an LOA book is also highly readable and it just feels good in your hands, book lovers. Um, a 700 page volume by LOA is not heavy, um, but neither is the print squinchy and neither does the shadow of the ink of the opposing page show through. I'm talking to you as a reader now. So reading an LOA title is a just a deeply pleasurable and sensual act. And so uh, as you've seen, behold, um, the book so created um, by, um, the new collection of Rachel Carson's three sea books, Under the Sea Wind, The Sea Around Us, and The Edge of the Sea, all three of those books are actually compiled together in this one volume with some of her other short form writings on oceanography and marine biology. And indeed, this is 700 pages. Um, but it's just a chubby little thing. And I weighed it on my kitchen scale. It's uh, one pound, seven ounces. <laughs> and um, it contains also this sort of amazing memo um, that, sh that Carson wrote to her publicist in which she actually reveals her writing process and how she, what kind of narrative strategy she chose to write about the sea and how, imagery, how she thinks about imagery and rhythm. And so you can really see her writer's mind at work. Um, happy about it. Um, and let me be really clear that I was chosen to be the editor at, uh, for this endowed um, book and write the introduction to this collection is the honor of a lifetime and possibly also the most intimidating assignment, writing assignment that I've ever been given. Um, with the exception of this collection um, of Rachel Carson's, which is Silent Spring and Her Other Environment, Library of America broke, uh, brought out in 2018 and for which I also served as the editor. So hence, um, and thus together, these two books represent something close to the complete works of the most amazing biologist and nonfiction writer on any topic, I would argue, of the 20th century, whose work repositioned and redefined the relationship between human beings and the environment that we inhabit, kicked off a social movement in which many of us two and three generations later still labor as part of what Rachel Carson and I would both call a human rights struggle the right to a safe and livable environment that has become the defining issue of our time. And by the way, the United Nations Human Rights Council just last month um, formally recognized and codified that the access to a safe environment is a fundamental human right. And that um, codification is a direct legacy of, of Rachel Carson. So I imagine our evening together as a conversation and thus I just have a few points to make as part of my formal remarks. And anyway, these points are more queries for our mutual consideration than arguments. And I intend them uh, to entice you into this volume. And I'll begin in a way that Rachel Carson never would, which is autobiographically. Um, so I am speaking to you from my home office in upstate New York. And what you can't see is that I'm wearing a cast on my foot as the result of falling down a flight of concrete stairs in the dark in Washington DC a month ago. And what I want you to know is that I had gone there to prepare, I got, had gone there prepared, I had gone there as a PhD scientist, as an ecologist who studies the climate crisis at the invitation of indigenous women to risk arrest at the White House as part of a civil disobedience campaign called People Versus Fossil Fuels. And I had brought with me a letter that I had written to President Biden co-authored by climate scientist Peter Kalmus of NASA, one of our most storied climate scientists in America. And I believe Peter's out there in the audience tonight somewhere. Um, this letter that we wrote um, was signed by nearly 400 of America's leading research scientists. That letter demanded that the president act on the science that shows clearly that we are heading for climate catastrophe because he's not acting on the science. But then I fell down some stairs and broke my ankle hours before the action. So by the time I was arrested and taken into custody on October 14th, I was on crutches. I was not hurt by the police, but some of the indigenous leaders who invited me there, um, who were over at the Department of the Interior at this, I was reading this letter aloud in front of the White House, they were in fact so brutalized. So there were actually multiple scientists arrested with me last month 
There are climate scientists who are arrested for other acts of civil disobedience in the United Kingdom just recently, and, are, and these scientists are now possibly facing lengthy prison sentences. So this is what I want you to know. Most of the ecologists and climate scientists I worked with have or are planning to, um, because governments have become deaf to the findings of science. Scientists were not risking arrest because no one was listening. When Rachel Carson was writing her three C books in 1941, 1950, and 1955, it was a different cultural moment. When the findings of science held a different place, a more exalted place, I would say, a more authoritative place in the culture and in the body politic. Carson's animating goal as the explainer of oceanography and the findings of marine science was not to convince political leaders and the general public to listen and act on science. She could assume that they would, but rather her challenge was to be accepted as a legitimate voice of science. She could be discounted for who she was, less so for the facts that she wanted to convey. She was a woman, an unmarried, childless woman, a spinster, as one of her prominent detractors called her, which was code for something else. Her problem was not the message, but rather it was herself as the messenger. And that's a different struggle than what I and other environmental scientists now face. So here's how I write about um, Carson's theory of social change in my introduction. Um, and in spite of the elegant, um, an easy to read typeface. Um, I am, I need reading glasses, so hang on here. Get this all squared away. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Huey, for teaching me Roman numerals. So I'm on going to this page. Um, So altogether, these three titles reveal the complex, hitherto unseen majesties of a world in which the human race scarcely appears. If readers could visualize the watery world below the mirrored surface of the sea, teeming with communities of interacting creatures, each possessed with emotions and personality, if we could travel back through geological time and witness the birth of an island, if we understood the physics of waves, if we could look up and down the surf through the eyes of a storm-tossed shorebird or up at the moon from the stony bottom of a tide pool, we might, the author believed, experience wonder and humility. And wonder and humility, said Rachel Carson, and this is her quote, wonder and humility do not exist side by side with a lust for destruction. So she began this uh, trilogy um, with a belief that if she could, using language that was as beautiful as the sea itself, um, make her readers feel the humility and wonder of this place, that they would not destroy it. Um, that sentiment doesn't, you know, we exist in a different cultural moment now. So my, my sort of open question to us for our con, um, kind of collective consideration tonight is um, of what value is us now? And I have some thoughts on that, um, but, but I wanna share them in the, in the Q&A. Uh, and first um, talk a little bit about um, the first two books in this trilogy. The first, Under the Sea Wind, came out in 1941. It documents the oceanic travels of a dozen or so individual sea creatures who are given names and have agency um, as they migrate long distances. And, and this is actually my favorite book of the three. It had the terrible misfortune of being uh, its publication date almost exactly corresponding to the attack on Pearl Harbor. So Under the Sea Wind barely sold 2,000 copies and quickly went out of print. It only became a bestseller after the publication of Carson's second book, The Sea Around Us in 1950, which was a publishing phenomenon. It was just a kind of a juggernaut, stayed on the bestseller list month after month. And as in Under the Sea Wind, the ocean in the sea around us serves not as the setting, but as the main character of the story. The sea is the driver of the plot, the inhuman, magisterial overmind, vast, fecund, ruthless, indifferent, indomitable. Now, there was a shift um, for Carson um, that happened 
uh, in the late 1950s. And so the, se the second book, The Sea Around Us, came out in a second edition um, in the early 60s, right when she was working on Silent Spring. And it's this second edition that we include in this collection. And I'm, I'm really pleased with that editorial choice reveals that Carson was no longer comfortable with the idea that the sea was just this inviolate place beyond the touch of what she would call man. Um, and in fact, she makes a big corrective um, about that in the second edition when she kind of frames it up uh, for readers the second time. Because what happened between 1950 and 1960 to change her mind about this was um, the Cold War and her um, access to data showing that the ocean was being used to dump nuclear waste and the products of atomic bomb testing and, and fallout and that these things were siphoning their way of the food chain being carried by currents um, and altering the ecology of the ocean itself. And that was a really new idea for her. Um, and she wrote that she had had a, taken a certain comfort in the idea that the sea was inviolate, um, but now that she realized it wasn't, um, that no account of the sea was of note of all this kind of nuclear dumping. So when she revised that second edition, then um, that became part of the what woven into the narrative. And that and that um, second edition is what's included in our collection. Um, the book success, the both the first and the second edition, which was just immediate, I and mean, there was just so much hunger for her words. Um, is, is it, I was trying to figure out how to explain this in the introduction. Um, and what I sort of landed on was that it was really the, um, the effect of World War II, which had brought to the public's mind a lot of fascination with submarine warfare and with this of, of sonar. But what people lacked as they thought about these things was any sort of visual picture of what it looked like down there. Because remember, this was at a time when there, the underwater photography and underwater filmmaking wasn't really a thing yet. So even though there were sort of submersibles and submarines, um, people had not, not really seen what it looked like below the surface of the sea. And so Carson's language itself had to function as a kind of camera. Um, and her, her, her writerly strategy was to be cinematic and, and use her knowledge, her very precise knowledge as a marine biologist to extrapolate what the creatures would be doing down there and what that would all look like, um, how they would find food and mates and chase each other and cooperate, compete, feed upon each other. Um, what, how could she show us that imagistically um, and the way she did it was to, with exquisite knowledge of the anatomy of these creatures brought up from the abyss and from the deep, deep sea and, and could um, deduce and induce what kind of habitat they would live in, how, what they would feeding on by the shape of their jaws, and then cr create a plot, um, create scenes, um, have flashbacks, have um, uh, uh, suspense. Um, and, uh, and do all the writerly things so that we could start to imagine what that undersea world looked like. So we have to keep in mind, all of us who have seen, you know, grown up on Jacques Cousteau and seen all kinds of Nova specials, um, that the readers uh, in the mid, in mid 20th century who were reading this had no real picture yet of what it, it looked like down there. So um, read to you a bit from page, um, 17 in Roman numerals. Okay. Um, the sea around us appeared at a time when public interest in the watery realm below the ocean's waves were, was high, peaked by developments in radar, echolocation, and submarine operations during World War II, but before observational equipment, fiber optics, and low light cameras brought moving into our living room. The manned bathyscope christened, christened Trieste would not reach the bottom of the Mariana Trench in the Western Pacific Ocean until 1960. The research submarine named Alvin operated by the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute and as of 2021 um, is still in service. It did not begin its operations until 1964. Hence, during the post-war science ascendant 1950s, the sea around us filled a curiosity void. 
combining evocative metaphor and vivid lyrical imagery with the latest oceanographic findings, Carson created a language for the book that functioned like an underwater documentary, documentary film at a time when there were none. So now I wanna say a few words about Carson as a woman who loved women and how she brought a queer eye to the natural world. I am also a queer biologist with a lot of thoughts about what we miss when science is only practiced by white, straight, privileged men. So the sperm fertilizes the egg. That's how we say it, right? Sperm is the subject of the sentence and the egg is the object. We could say the egg fertilizes the sperm, which sounds funny. And if we do say it this way, we would actually be acknowledging that mammalian ova release parahormonal signals that act as a GPS device to sperm, actively attracting and guiding them. Without these signals from the egg, the sperm would lack directionality and simply just wiggle in place. So the egg actually also has agency. We didn't know about these parahormonal signaling devices of mammalian ova for a much longer time than we should have. No one thought to look because the masculine language of biology blinded us even to the possibility. So the correction the, that the egg fertilizes the sperm was made by a queer microbiologist by the name of Dr. Bonnie Spanier, the only biologist actually that I know of to ever head up a women's studies program. So I don't directly take on Carson's identity in my introductions to either one of these two collections, but I do wanna use this moment to urge my fellow scholars in LGBT to take up Carson um, and um, kind of apply this sort of wonderful, rich um, intellectual thinking of queer studies to the work of Carson. Um, I think there's a lot of scholarship about the phenomenology of science and, um, and the importance of representation in science and, um, and, and Carson needs to be kind of brought into that conversation. Carson herself and lived in fear about disclosure, rightly so, of her romantic relationships as her love letters reveal. Um, she did not name herself. So that created a dilemma for me as the editor of these collections because I neither wanted to participate in and continue that erasure, um, but neither did I want to apply language historically. Um, Rachel, you can come out of the closet now, but. I'm not exactly sure what language to use. Um, so my language in these introductions is to talk about Carson's various women companions and uh, refer to um, her lover Dorothy as her beloved. Um, and so here's where I now get to introduce you to the final book of the trilogy, At the Edge of the Sea, um, which explores the liminal uh, shoreline um, the place where land and water touch. Um, and it's, uh, as Carson said, it's the place of our um, ancestral beginnings. And it's the most intimate of the three books. And it's the, it's the one that she actually narrates with a little bit of first person. So it's kind of on a human scale as opposed to the other two books. Um, and so here's, uh, I'm gonna read Carson's words to you now. Um, and here's, um, a passage from the opening chapter of her third book. Um, and in this chapter, um, and this, by the way, her fi the final trilogy, the final book in this trilogy is as uh, a book she de dedicated to her beloved Dorothy um, and her husband Stanley. Um, and then this is a, a passage that appears right near the beginning when Carson takes. Uh, us with her into a, an enchanted place at the threshold of the sea. It's a pool uh, filled cave that's accessible only at low tide. So this is Carson talking to us now. Um, so I knelt on the wet carpet of sea moss and looked back into the dark cavern that held the pool in a shallow basin. The floor of the cave was only a few inches below the roof and a mirror had been created in which all that grew on the ceiling was reflected in the still water below. Under water that was clear as glass, the pool was carpeted with green sponge. 
gray patches of sea squirts glistened on the ceiling and colonies of soft coral were a pale apricot color. In the moment when I looked into the cave, a little elfin starfish hung down, suspended by the merest thread. The beauty of the reflected images of the limpid pool itself was the poignant beauty of things that are ephemeral, existing only until the sea should return to fill the little cave. Whenever I go down into this magical zone of the low water of the spring's tides, I look for the most delicately blooming of all the shore's inhabitants, flowers that are not plant but animal, blooming out on the threshold of the deeper sea. I knew that they were merely waiting in that moment of the tides ebbing for the return of the sea. Then in the rush of the water, in the surge of the surf, and the pressure of the incoming tide, the delicate flower heads would stir with life. They would sway on their slender stalks and their long tentacles would sweep the returning water, finding in it all that they needed for life. And so in that enchanted place, on the threshold of the sea, the realities that possessed my mind were far from those of the land world that I had left an hour before. And to um, close off my this kind of part of our evening together, I just want to return uh, then at the end to, to the climate crisis. Um, there is a chapter in, uh, I want to um, recommend to you, um, in her second book, The Sea Around Us, and that chapter is called The Global Thermostat, where Carson explicates for us the role of the ocean in stabilizing and creating the art, the climate up in the up in our Earth's atmosphere, um, and in this chapter, um, I see Carson as kind of as a historical ecological Charles Darwin. You know, Darwin was able to a theory of natural selection to explain evolution, a working understanding of genes, even though his contemporary, Gregor Mendel, um, was kind of separately working all that out. You know, the grand unifying theory of biology is when genetics and evolution kind of come together. Um, Carson was writing about the way in which the sea stabilized the ocean and was able to see that the temperature was rising and the seas were rising without a working understanding that methane and carbon dioxide were greenhouse gases that were building up in the atmosphere and that's what was driving the change. That research was available. Um, a few scientists knew it at the time, but Carson, that was the missing piece for Carson. Um, but um, her ability to piece together almost every, even without understanding um, greenhouse gases, um, is just actually remarkable. So let's, um, let's let Carson have the last word here. Um, uh, let's see, am I, here we go. Here's, and this again is from the chapter titled The Global Thermostat. It documents how regulate energy and regulate uh, Earth's climate. So this is Carson talking to us again. But for the president, but for the present, the evidence that the top of the world is growing warmer is to be found on every hand. The recession of the northern glaciers is going on at such a rate that many smaller ones have already disappeared. If the present rate of melting continues, others follow. Um, she said that in 1950. So let's a little bit. And first of all, I just want to say there's an amazing marine biologist, Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson at the Urban Ocean Institute, whose work is central to help us, us understand the knowledge of how the ocean is both driving some of the, uh, the uh, stabilizing and destabilizing the climate right now, but also uh, how it's been left out of global climate talks um, and the ways in which the ocean could become our ally in um, stabilizing the climate. Because uh, as uh, Dr. Johnson points out, 93% of the, of the heat that's trapped by greenhouse gases, as well as one third of the greenhouse gases themselves, like are actually absorbed directly by the ocean. So the oceans are buffering and protecting us from the, from the 
vast majority of the harm of climate change right now. Um, but as a consequence, um, the wa water is warming and that causes thermal expansion. And, and that is what's causing the sea level to rise. And in addition, carbon dioxide turns into carbonic acid when it's absorbed by seawater and that's causing the ocean to become acidic. So acidification is um, making things with calcium carbonate, which is to say things with shells, uh, dissolve because at some point if you lower things with shells begin to dissolve and that includes zooplankton and diatoms um, who are the babies and children of um, things like barnacles um, uh, that have, and even now we understand that shark skin itself is starting to dissolve because of the acidification of the ocean so the ocean is now we're dissolving the creatures that live in it um, and further warm water doesn't hold as much oxygen as cold water. So there's a deoxygenization of the ocean going on. And then finally the heat itself on the surface of the is killing off the phytoplankton. Um, and phytoplankton provide us half of all the oxygen we breathe. So one of every two breaths you take is brought, is brought to you by um, the, all the trees of the world. Um, and, and the fact that we don't know this, is part of the problem is that why this is all happening and marine biology knows it, but it's not part of our political discussion is that no nation is responsible for the oceans. They're part of the commons. And so this is something um, that marine biologists are now trying to get our attention on. And I just wanna call out, especially again, Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson um, for helping us understand this. So I'm gonna close with Carson's words and give her the last, um, the last say on all this, and this is um, why I did all this in Roman numerals. I can't tell you. Um, oh, I'm sorry. That's the section I already want. I, I've already read to you when she says, "If the present rate of melting continues, others, um, other glaciers will also follow." So with this, um, three quick thank yous, um, not only to, of course, Library of America, um, but also to the uh, queer writer, Taylor Borby, um, native of North Dakota, um, and uh, who has a forthcoming book called B Boys and Oil, Growing Up Gay in a uh, Fractured World, uh, coming out in June from um, Norton. Um, Taylor accompanied me on a research trip to Hawk Mountain, um, which is a place that Rachel came over and over and she first started developing her uh, ideas as a biologist. And I uh, took a pilgrimage, Taylor and I took a pilgrimage to Hawk Mountain this I was um, as a research trip uh, to uh, prepare to write this introduction. And the opening scene uh, of my introduction in this collection um, is from that um, research trip. So thank you, Taylor. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Bob Muzel, who is the uh, uh, CEO of the Rachel Carson Council, who's kind of keeping carrying Rachel's banner on in this in this world. Um, Dr. Muzel um, is a real scholar of uh, Carson's and served as my reader um, as I as I um, put my remarks together, and has been a longtime supporter of mine. And then thank you to my own employer, who is the Science and Environmental Health Network. I mean, I will uh, drop the, uh, the our website into the chat here in a second in case you want to get our newsletter. The Science and Environmental Health Network um, is carrying Carson's banner forward, and that's why scientists um, we provide science and legal resources to communities who are fighting for future generations, um, which is a phrase. Um, uh, right from Carson. So I'm very grateful um, both to be in this amazing shop of scientists and attorneys who make it so to take Carson's vision of a world in which the right to a safe and healthy environment is a fundamental human right and reorganize our policies and our laws that align uh, with the science according to the vision that Rachel's provided for us. And that's it from me. Um, Really looking forward to your comments and questions and back to you, Max. Sandra, that was terrific. Um, thank you so much. Extremely provocative and productive and fruitful comments. And, and as you can tell from the questions, which are coming in from many different directions. So let me just uh, start with, there are some questions about kind of 
you know, uh, Rachel Carson's pra writing practice and observation practice. So I'll just ask a couple of those first. Um, Susan Emanuel from New Harbor, Maine, which she says is not far from the Rachel Carson tide pool, asks how much was Carson dependent on personal observation of specific sites? And I guess a companion question to that comes from Michael Barton from West Lynn, Oregon, who asks, did Carson ever physically explore under the surface of the ocean? Yeah, um, and yes to both. So she went on several research vessels um, going out to sea and exploring. Um, and she also went on dives and pretty much did that with her companion, Shirley Briggs. And it was Shirley who also accompanied Carson to Hawk Mountain. So Shirley bookends my introduction. So um, she, uh, she and Carson would go on these um, excavations up to the top of the mountain where Carson was actually thinking about the bottom of the sea when she was on top of the mountain. And then also went with Shirley um, to Florida and did these dives that helped her um, write the final part of her last book, which uh, describes uh, coral reefs. So yes to both of those things. And I, she would have done a lot more of it. It was expensive. It was hard to afford. Um, and um, you know she wasn't as supported as as men were, um, who were marine biologists who were uh, you know going out to sea a lot. But she found she found her way. Um, she found her way both below the surface and out to the open sea. Yeah. Uh, great. There's there's also many questions from uh, scientists uh, and academics and sci uh, science academics. Uh, Patty DeMarco, a Carson scholar from Chatham University, asks. Uh, what can scientists do to amplify Carson's message in Congress? And there's a, another question sort of similar, not well related from Eric Morell in Delaware City, Delaware, who asks, um, what space is there in today's training of scientists for looking deeply at Carson as a scientist who waded into public controversy through her writing? Are we graduating scientists now who are prepared to take similar risks? Or is she going to end up being a historical outlier? So I guess that asked, that's a question about the training of scientists. Uh, and then there's another question about um, a last final question here from Elena Stone of Cambridge, Massachusetts. What can today's uh, environmental activists and scientists learn from Carson's poetic and lyrical approach to the natural world? So three kind of different questions, yeah, but sort of, yeah. Yeah, I like I like the way you group them. Um, well, I think that. Uh, scientists are already doing, um, are kind of already taking that next step, right? And so what's alarming to us and what we said in um, the 400 scientists who signed our letter, and by the way, that's still a living document and um, um, you can find it, <laughs> the scientist's letter to um, President Biden um, that Peter Kalmus and I dra drafted and that, you know, it's still, um, we hope to reach a thousand signatures. So. Um, what what I see is scientists realizing that um, this old idea that we had that Carson I think had too right that first comes science we get observations and data and then if science discovers a problem the the place where Carson wanted to kind of cast her net was to take that the findings of science to the public because obviously science with public dollars that this public should know what the science says and then they should decide um, they should have informed consent and as citizens um, be able to insist um, to political governments align our policies with the findings of science and so she kind of put herself in the middle between policy and science as the kind of science whisperer right to to um to the public whether it was about the findings of oceanography or about um, you know, how pesticides be, behave in a system. She was going to explain it in a way that was so beautiful and compelling with her prose that you couldn't stop re reading, right? And then you felt smart by the time you were done. Um, and so I think what we're realizing now in this moment is that the, the space for science to speak has closed. Um, and science has simply been discounted and ignored. And there's, and it's also, um, we're surrounded by and so in some ways activism precedes science that's what i see happening now so there's activism that's happening 
that opens a space for science to speak. So when indigenous women ask me as a scientist to come and stand with them and read a letter that scientists have written to the president, then you know a lot of us are responding to that because that um, science alone and, and gently making the case to Congress, because Carson herself did this, right? She gave many pre presentations to the public, including congressional testimonies, some at the very end of her life when she was really suffering from cancer. Um, but that it hasn't worked. Um, so scientists are um, moving um, into activism more, more directly. See. And, and then there was the third question that I've forgotten. Can you just prompt me? Well, that, actually, that's a good bridge to the next set of questions because okay. that, that question was about, you know, uh, what can scientists and activists learn from uh, Carson's lyrical approach? And that kind of, you know, leads to the question of Carson as a writer. And, I, and there are many, many questions about that. And just, um, you know, Rebecca uh, Giggs from Melbourne in Wurundj Wurundjeri County, I assume that's Australia, but I, I'm not positive. Can you talk about Carson's contributions to the genre of narrative nonfiction? She's thinking about her use of non-human persona, but I mean, that question could go a lot of places. Um, Carmen from Long Island says, should Carson's books be placed in the creative writing curriculum? I think, you know, all these questions we could kind of group onto the larger rubric of, you know, um, what are your views on, you know, on Carson as a, as a writer uh, and how, and, and specifically, I guess, on the challenges of being a scientist and a writer, which is something you know a lot about. I mean, how do you think about that with, you know, with Carson? Yeah, I mean, my, my writing strategies are different than Carson's, but I think that um, here's the thing about Rachel Carson. She was an equally precise scientist and writer. Um, a, a writer who takes science as a topic or a scientist who's a, you know, kind of good at explaining stuff. She was like remarkably ingenious at both things. And so um, what, so she could, she could, she's a, a nonfiction writer, she's a scientist, she's, she's both. So the, the problem with being so genius in two things is that you, you kind of become uncategorizable, right? And um, so Carson believed that the way to write about the sea that would entrance people, that would keep them reading, would be to turn them away from their own humanity and make them a creature, to, um, to, put, to place them into a strange world where there are no human creatures, which I think is a, um, a really unusual narrative strategy because almost all of the men writing about the sea place themselves in the story. And she wanted there to be almost no narrator. Um, so you were, you became, you know, the, um, the flounder in the chase scene. Um, the, the problem with that is it, it could participate in this sort of Homeric tradition of these um, creatures going on long voyages, right? Um, she wanted the, it to be clear to her readers that the sea was the agent of the story that drove everything. Um, so it wasn't like heroic journeys, human journeys. You, you got invested in a creature and then they were suddenly just gone and torn apart in a flash, right? And, and then another creature would take that, that pl place. And so she chose very specifically certain species that traveled long distances so she could take the reader on a literal journey across vast amounts of space. Um, and that's, that was her strategy in the first book. In the second book, she wanted to take us into deep time. So she wanted to go back in time. So rather than use the life of an individual creature, she used the birth of an island, right? It's a kind of a geological, um, physical, chemical kind of event rather than a living event. And, it's, and it reads almost like Genesis. Um, and then, so, so not only she, did she know how to use imagery, um, how to set a scene, how, how to create suspense um, and all these kind of novelistic elements, but you can scan her work. And, and she writes about this actually in a letter, I think to Dorothy somewhere, um, but I've done this. You can, if she wanted to build up um, a sense of uh, urgency, she would use, um, um, like spondaic rhythm. If she wanted to uh, pause for a moment and get you to think about the majesty of the sea, she would use uh, Shakespearean rhythm, old fashioned iambic. Um, 
and, and, and then she would use these trochees and these spondies to sort of jam it all up if she was trying to stop the action, which are techniques we all use in the poetry classroom that she knew very well. And so um, <laughs> there's a lot here for literary critics to sink their teeth into. Yeah. Yeah, I would add that, you know, one of the passages that um, you, you quote is, you know, that passage where she says, to stand at the edge of the sea, to sense the ebb and flow of the tides, to feel the breath of a mist moving over the great salt marsh. That sentence works kind of like the tides. Mm -hmm. Just to say it kind of spills out into bigger and, you know, it kind of expands and then it retracts at the end, kind of like the subject she's talking about. But, um, um, and just to say, she also, yeah. when she revised, she would read out loud her work and she would change like a two syllable adjective to a one syllable to make the rhythms work better. So she was working in this very aesthetic way. Um, so a kind of a follow-up question to those is, Alice from Chicago says, could you talk about the role Carson's writing played in your own development as a scientist writer? And, and I guess, I, you know, I would expand that a little bit and ask, you know, how did you discover her? Uh, you know, what role did she play? You know, was there a favorite book, you know, that, that, that brought you to Carson and that kept you coming back to Carson? And then finally, you know, rereading these three books for this edition, did anything strike you that you hadn't noticed about them before? Yeah, well, briefly, and I actually um, kind of talk a little bit about that in the very opening of the introduction to this volume, which is to say that Carson has been in my life for my whole life, um, because my very conservative adoptive father, um, uh, diet in the wool Republican, taught business at the local high school, and he used Silent Spring as a course textbook. So when it came, it was published when I was three, um, and I remember that book um, coming out in and out of my father's briefcase even before I could read. So. Um, and it made a big impression on my dad because then he all of a sudden, he was a World War II vet that he struggled with, but he became an organic gardener after he read um, Silent Spring and put my sister and I to work kind of selling his organic tomatoes at the side of the road. And we would, at the very young age, like age seven, I was explaining Rachel, like what organic meant at the time when nobody really knew that word. And I said, well, it's Rachel, what Rachel Carson does, right? So as a little kid, she was in my life. Um, and then I also became a biologist and, um, and, and have an advanced degree in creative writing. And for me, um, biology and poetry are both about the mystery of being alive, right? Biology attempts to solve the mystery. Poetry simply says, behold. And there are ways that you can create prose uh, based on the principles of poetry and you those, that language to explore the natural world, which seems to both Carson and to me as this exquisitely beautiful poetic place, right? So I, I uh, do that too. Um, and, um, and she and I both have had cancer diagnoses. We're both queer women. So there's those parallels, but I um, feel free to use autobiography and put myself in the story in ways that Carson um, didn't do, I think, um, because she felt the need to be invisible, but also she felt a kind of humility um, in the face of the natural world, that it was sublime, it was bigger than um, hu humans. And she wanted um, that sort of sense of wonder that comes when you're like looking at you know, all the stars in the sky. She wanted you to feel that looking at the ocean. So she wanted to dehumanize you, um, and, and that that sort of decentered kind of odd feeling because there's nothing to relate to when she puts you down in the water was part of her intent. Mm. Different strat strategies around that. Um, so she's both model and counter model for me. And to kind of answer the own, my, my own question that I posed, I think the value of her voice for us now, even though we're in a very different political moment, um, is to to see that she was able to capture um, the imagination um, and the attention of the public um, th through beauty. Um, and, and there is still a role, I think. I mean, this is where the, why the arts are so important. Um, I mean, we understand, um, you know, the Great Depression because of um, grapes of wrath, right? There, I mean, there are these w windows into certain kinds of, like what would we really know what the Dust Bowl was without without that novel, right? And I, I feel like Carson is playing a kind of role for us now. Um, and that what's required in this particular political historical moment is courage. And she had it in great abundance. And so 
she certainly feeds my soul in that way. And I feel like she could do that for other people. One of the things that Carson liked to do was quote, um, she thought it was Abraham Lincoln, but it wasn't. It was uh, actually another woman poet she was quoting, but it was a phrase that um, she, she then wrote in a letter to her beloved Dorothy. She said, to sin by silence when they should protest makes cowards out of men. Mm. And I think that's something we can take for this moment. Um, that's really interesting. And just, uh, I mean, there's a question that kind of relates to that. Um, Francesca from Seattle asks, why do you think scientists, ecologists, atmospheric chemists, and others were so cautious about coming forward about the dangers of the greenhouse effect, as it was called back then, about global warming? Why, given the outspoken example of Carson? And, I, you know, I was going to ask, a similar thing you had mentioned earlier about the ways in which Carson being a woman and being, you know, uh, not having her own children made her um, someone who was not an authority uh, uh, and, and opened her to criticism. And But I guess the flip side of that is, was there something about her outsiderness which made it possible for her to both see and act the way she, she did? I mean, do you see it that way at all? I, I kind of do. And I think that this persona that was created both by her, but also projected on her from other people. The idea that she was this solitary, gentle soul, right? Um, it was disarming when she uh, debated um, the chemical industry um, because it, it was easy for them to look like villains against you know, the gentle um, sort of, she was slightly built. Um, um, woman. So it, it gave her a kind of um, appeal that people could kind of root for her. Um, but the fact of it is she wasn't solitary at all, right? And she, um, at the end of her life, when she had so much, uh, meta many metastases and tumors in her cervical vertebrae, and she couldn't even write, physically write anymore, or use a typewriter, there was a whole home, her the house filled up with women, um, one of them was Marjorie Spock and Marjorie Spock's lifetime partner who helped uh, actually sort of fed her uh, information about the chemical industry that uh, they got through uh, the act of legal discovery from a lawsuit they were working on, shared the data with Carson, um, you know, the, the, just her home filled with women who helped she could um, dictate to at the end of her life when she couldn't write herself. So there was a big kind of collaborative effort and she was always traveling with women. She wasn't out there all alone. Um, but I think the, um, the, the kind of false picture, if you will, of Carson as this solitary scientist alone in the world um, sort of served her at the moment and the political moment she was in um, and made her a sympathetic figure um, in the public. But I do think there's this great need now <laughs> to revise that and to place Carson in this woman-centered world with women researchers doing all these kind of things. Um, and, and, and really there's just room out there for a lot more scholarship about who she was, how she saw the world and how she created. Um, uh, speaking of which, <laughs> uh, let me follow up with, with, with on that a little bit. So all, you know, all writers' journeys are, are personal journeys to some extent. And um, you've talked a little bit about how Carson's life affected her work, but I'm, I'm thinking of some other things too, and I wonder what you think. I mean, you've talked about the fact that she, you know, autobiography wasn't her thing, and yet there are clearly connections between uh, resonances, I should say, between aspects of her personal life and her work. And so I'm curious about what you think about, you know, growing up on a farm in Western Pennsylvania, you know, what kind of, a, you know, what did that, how did that influence her work, becoming a caretaker for her mother, and then for several adoptive children uh, in the course of her life? How did that affect illness you mentioned and the fact that she hid it as well? Um, I mean, those those things, how do you see them kind of, in, you know, affecting or influencing her work? Well, certainly the influence of her mother can't be uh, underestimated. And, and um, Rachel's own biography or Linda Lear really makes this clear in a way that I think is, um, is correct. That um, there was a kind of um, teach your child to wonder nature movement when at the beginning of the 20th century when um, Carson was born in, I think, what, 19, oh, now I forgot, 1907 maybe. Um, so, uh, and, and 
so Carson's mother took Rachel out into the natural world and it was and Carson describes the discovery of finding a fossilized sea creature in a rock in you know in, in the middle of Pennsylvania she um, but it it um, the evidence of that alone that that there had been this other time in deep time when life looked very different than now it was just absolutely enchant enchanting to her um, so she she definitely was part of an embedded extended family but most she was especially in her later life the, the sort of breadwinner for all of these people, including um, people who just weren't very employable, um, nieces and nephews, and then she became the adoptive mother of her own grand nephew. Um, and so her need to constantly raise money and keep the whole family going um, was certainly part of uh, the story of these three books. Um, so she ended up um, as a public servant, she worked in fish and wildlife. She wrote a lot of copy for catalogs and kind of technical writing. And one of the things she turned in was so lyrically beautiful that her editor at Fish and Wildlife said, you know what, this doesn't work for us, but I think you should take this to the Atlantic. So that, that's when she began to see, right, that she could actually make money on the side writing in this um, po more popular way. Um, so she did it to actually generate money and, and literally feed all these people that were depending on her. Um, and, and that led to the book deal. So um, yeah, she's a complicated person, never exactly alone as she wanted to be alone. <laughs> I mean, she had so many responsibilities taking care of her grand nephew, um, her mother when she was ailing. Um, and she often would say in her letters to Dorothy, you know, if I can just get, if I can just stop being a nursemaid and get everyone to go to bed, I'll get a second wind and I can finish this chapter. Um, but it was hard, it was hard. Her creative life was, um, she wasn't Dar what Charles Darwin in that respect, right? I mean, Charles Darwin had a house full of servants and a wife to keep all of his kids away from him and he could just do his work. Um, she was balancing many, many things. Okay, well, we're we're coming to the end of our hour. Um, there are there are so many questions people have, and I would just I guess maybe we could end maybe with um, there are many questions asking, what can I do? What can an individual do? Uh, I mean, uh, and then there are many other questions asking, you know, um, how can Rachel Carson help us in what we need to do now? Um, that is to say, you know, why and how? Why do you recommend Rachel Carson to a young activist today or a young uh, scientist today? So I, I mean, I don't know where you want to get into that, but there, as I say, there are many people want to know what it is. What can I do to help the situation with the ocean? And then also, I guess, I guess, what is Rachel Carson's message to us and to the people who are asking that question? Right. Um, let me answer the second one first. So I think Carson um, brought the ocean to us in a way that when I reread her and then I read a lot of contemporary findings uh, on marine biology and oceanography, she really holds up. So in other words, if you dive into this collection, the science that she's presenting you which is based on kind of mid 20th century findings. She was so good at being able to extrapolate from the data and see, um, like it's like she had 65 pieces of a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle and was able to see the, what the, the picture was. And now we've, through science, we've published lots more and we've put the other you know, thousand pieces together, but she was able to use language basically, like in other words, the science in this still is good. So you should just dive in and learn about the sea. Um, and, I, and then I always frustrate my own readers by saying, I'm never going to tell you what to do based on your reading of this. You know, that's a, a process for your own self discernment. I can tell you what I've done, which is that I have entirely given up my academic life as a scientist and moved into the Science and Environmental Health Network, which is an advocacy organization because it is no longer the case. And every scientist I know would, I think, agree with me on this, that we scientists can take data and speak truth to power and go to Congress and say, hey, this is what's happening and, and have political leaders go, oh my gosh, you know, we're about ready to lose the plankton in the ocean. Um, we're about ready to dissolve everybody that lives in there. We need to change our energy system. It doesn't work that way anymore. 
And so there is a human rights struggle. It's been fought by youth, this leaders, and now what I see happening is the world's climate scientists and ecologists, those of us who are seeing the data and are terrified, and we see that no one's acting in, at the scale that we need to act, we are jo joining those frontline folks. So what your own individual role is, is whatever your skill set is that you can bring to this human rights struggle. Um, you know, you don't want to be a good German and pretend that you don't see the signs of, of what's ha happening all around us. So we're called to open our eyes and to look at this. So I would just invite everyone to take a look at this collection, read Carson, do some discernment, and then look around. As Carson used to say, uh, lift up your head, look about you to see what other alternatives are available to you. There are many people doing many amazing things right now. Many starting points, there are many entry points, and we need artists involved, we need economists, we need attorneys, we need people to make good websites, uh, I mean, uh, and good social media platforms, because honestly, some of this work um, needs that support and doesn't have it right now. So there's a room for everyone in this. Um, so I think it's something we can only answer um, for ourselves. My little um, science and environmental health network um, can use your support. Um, and uh, so you take a look at our newsletters and see if you like um, what we're doing. But we're just one of many, right? Um, so I think um, there's a kind of willingness, not the willingness to look. And, and, and um, we're, we need heroic, courageous action. So whatever makes you feel courageous and heroic in your life is what we, we need. For me, as a cancer survivor, one of the things I discovered is I'm not afraid of being arrested. This whole skill set as a cancer patient who's used to being in MRI machines and bone having bone scans and being confined and being miserable and not freaking out. So I can go to jail for a couple of weeks and I'm okay. Some people think they can't do that, but I actually, you know, I've been hooked up to heparin locks and IV drips, I can be in handcuffs, I don't get freaked out. I didn't uh, like to get arrested with the broken bone, that was something I would have preferred not to have happen, but I can, I can play a part in that, right? So, and I'm also adopted, and so my, I bring a kind of ethos that comes out of um, being, um, ha having been kind of cast off and living in an institutional setting for a while and feeling an alignment with other displaced people as particularly climate refugees. So my own um, feelings of injustice about the adoption industry um, and the way uh, it was practiced when I was born, I can take that trauma and direct it toward um, people who are being displaced, families who are being broken apart, um, children who are being adopted out at our own border who are climate refugees coming from Central America. And so my willingness to work on that comes right out of my own autobiographical background. I don't know what's in um, your heart and in your own autobiographies, um, but surely there's some, um, some stuff <laughs> um, that you feel is how you manifest courage that can be brought to this um, struggle. Because I can say you feel better when you open your eyes and look and, and engage with it because we spend a lot of time trying to turn away because we think it's too painful, but actually it feels worse. No. Thank you so much, Sandra, for your, your, your honesty and your strength and your wisdom uh, on, on, on all these subjects. Um, we're very grateful to you for I'm here. so honored to be the editor of these collections and just the idea that Rachel is really now in this pantheon of other classic American writers um, that you, you know, kept alive. It, it, uh, and just to have been you and, and worked with the kind of genius staff at LOA has just been, again, it's been the honor of a lifetime. So thank you, Max. Well, thank you, Sandra. Um, You've been listening to Sandra Steingraber on Rachel Carson as scientist and poet of the sea. Sandra's New Library of America edition of Carson's Classic Sea Trilogy, number 352 in the Library of America series, which includes a 16 page portfolio of photographs has just been published. Uh, please join us for forthcoming online events from Library of America on Wednesday, December 15th. It's 
American Christmas stories, an unconventional look at the uniquely American literature inspired by this most wonderful time of the year. Uh, come ring in the holidays with acclaimed best-selling science fiction fantasy author Connie Willis, editor of this just published new collection, Jamaican-born novelist Nalo Hopkinson, a contributor, and Christmas historian Penny Ristad of the University of Texas at Austin. Details about this and other upcoming LOA live events can be found on our website, LOA.org, where you'll also find information about Library of America's Rachel Carson and Christmas Stories volumes and links to purchase those and other editions of Great American Writing. You'll also find recordings of tonight's and previous LOA live events. Uh, warmest thanks again to Sandra Steingraber for speaking to us this evening and have a great evening. Good night, everyone.